guys, welcome back. Today what I want to talk about is galactic evolution. Remember we talked about Hubble's tuning fork diagram, looking at elliptical galaxies, looking at spiral galaxies, looking at irregular galaxies. Well, how do those galaxies get to where they are and what we look at today? So, do galaxies evolve and change from one type to the other? As I said the other day, no, they really don't. The only time that they actually do that is when you actually have collisions going on. And we do know that there's a number of collisions out there in this very wide expanse we call the universe. In fact, um, we'll look at some pictures. and that, that will go ahead and cause those galaxies to change over time. But we can generally tell if they have gone through some kind of collision what happens after they leave and what the galaxy was like before they actually went through based on a lot of really sophisticated computer programming that allows us to model those. So let's go ahead and talk about galactic evolution or really what's going on is colliding galaxies. That's how these galaxies evolve. So do galaxy types evolve and change from one type to the other? Uh, sometimes yes, but really generally no. I mean, it's not really the way things work. But we certainly have seen what happens when galaxies do collide, and so we do know from that type, yes, they are changing. Do, are they merging from one into the other? Are they going from a elliptical to a spiral or a spiral to elliptical? No, we certainly don't see those kinds of things. So yes, sometimes, but generally no, unless something happens. And then the changes occur. And he said, because of the fact that you do have these collisions, you know, one rams into the other, or maybe they just kind of happen to be moving along in the same direction and finally go ahead and merge. And that occurs, obviously, guys, over time. Because remember how big these galaxies really are and what the distances between the individual stars within the galaxy are. So when we have galaxies that interact, they can do a number of things. Number one, they can distort each other with these tides that are producing tidal tails and shells of stars. So what does that really mean? Well, I'm going to show you here in a little bit. You can get these tails of these spirals. They get really strung out because of the fact that this one arm might be following the other galaxy when it leaves. Okay? And we can also get then stars that are left because we find that the gas and dust is certainly affected by what happens when these galaxies interact. And remember, as we talked with the evolution of and formation of stars, if I get these gas and dust clouds that go ahead and start collapsing, I'll form stars. So number two, we know that absorb smaller galaxies in a process called galactic cannibalism. So these larger galaxies, or even the smaller galaxies, can run into each other. They can absorb each other. They will then get larger, which means that if you've got a smaller galaxy coming toward that, they can pull it even more toward it. And so you will build up very large galaxies from this standpoint. And because of that, what happens when these galaxies interact they can certainly trigger rapid stellar formation, and, and that's going to be true. I mean, I'm going to show you some galaxies here. It's just stellar evolution all over the place, stellar formation all over the place, you know, simply because of the fact that we've had this condensation of the gas and dust and these big, dark clouds that are going to form these stars. Now, remember, guys, when we talk about the distances between stars and galaxies, they are so great that unless you took a direct hit of a core on a core, you're really never going to have individual stars colliding. I mean, it's, you know, the odds are astronomical. Uh, unless you are doing a direct hit on the cores, and then you might. But even within that, those distances are great enough. It's probably not going to be an issue. So if I look at this galaxy, hmm, I look at it, it does look a little bit different. Sometimes you can see where the galaxy is that it collided with. Sometimes you can't. It might be off the photograph itself. But remember that we can find out whether these galaxies are moving or not. And we can look at their direction of motion and tell whether we've got two galaxies that are going toward each other or two galaxies that are going away from each other, or two galaxies that are moving in the same direction or opposite directions. Remember, guys, we know that the Andromeda galaxy and our Milky Way galaxy will eventually run into each other by looking at their individual motions. Those two galaxies certainly are in the process of colliding or in the process of moving apart. I think they're in the process of colliding here. I personally think that looks like the owl. You know, I can kind of see a real owl sitting out there. But again, you can see that these two galaxies are certainly in the process of colliding and going through each other. Now, depending on what their motion is, are they making a direct hit toward each other? Are they going to do a glancing blow? I mean, it looks like when you look at the second one, the one on the left, it's got kind of a um, little arm up there that 
has a little bit more mass. So is that something that is being pulled apart because of the second galaxy? Now, we've also talked about these smaller galaxies. Now, if I look all the way back in time, so I'm looking at, you know, really the, when those galaxies first formed, we see an awful lot of smaller galaxies. Then when we aren't looking quite as far back, we come forward a little bit in time, we find that there are very large galaxies. And generally, these are elliptical galaxies. And so we think that these really big elliptical galaxies get formed simply because of the fact that smaller galaxies get cannibalized into it. Now, if you also remember what we talked about with elliptical galaxies, there shouldn't be any gas and dust lanes sitting there. And yet, you are seeing a gas and dust lane right there. So where'd that come from? Well, there's a good chance it came from the fact that this big elliptical galaxy ran into or cannibalized in a spiral galaxy. And so we're seeing the spiral gas and the spiral galaxy that had the gas and dust in there. We're still seeing that arm that is sitting there. Uh, they're definitely looking like this one has been spread out because of either a collision. Now, you probably, you're probably not seeing the second, gal the second galaxy there that was involved in the collision. You know, it's like they kind of left the scene there, guys. And so you can certainly see that tidal effect that went ahead and smeared out the rest of that galaxy. Also notice lots of blue areas there where you're getting a lot of really hot new stars that have formed. And look at this poor little spiral galaxy. Definitely see that tidal tail all the way down toward the center right. I mean, that thing is pulled out and it's following the gravitational attraction of that other galaxy that went through it. Also notice when you're looking at this picture, a lot of what you're seeing in that picture are not stars, they are other galaxies. So we're looking at a little cluster of galaxies right here. And even if you look at that spiral, I mean, it kind of looks a little lopsided like something happened to it. And this certainly, you look at this big spiral here, and you can even see the galaxy that ran into it. It's over there on the right. It's a much smaller one. You can see all that pink, which is where you have new stars that are forming. Because of the gas and dust that got compressed then once those two galaxies interacted. And so now it's a very active, very active place where you're going to have stars that are forming. I mean, look at this thing. I mean, it completely kind of tore this thing apart. And you have that really, really hot blue areas where you have new stars, you have more star formation. Definitely the result of two galaxies going through each other. And you can just tell by looking at it, it doesn't look normal. Something happened to it. Now, we're also going to be talking about ring galaxies. And ring galaxies are formed or the result of two galaxies that went through each other. And one of the things I'm going to have you do after we've done this now is I've got some websites posted on Blackboard that are simulations of what happens when galaxies run to, into each other or merge with each other and shows how you form some ring galaxies as well as how you're getting these tidal distortions within the galaxies themselves because of the gravitational attraction of the two. And so. Once we finish here, guys, I do want you to go ahead and check Blackboard so that we can go through and talk about those simulations. Have you watch them and then answer some questions about them. Those things are pretty cool, those ring galaxies when you look at them in space. Just like a nice little wreath of stars out there. Now remember I said when we look back in time, you're seeing smaller galaxies. You know, don't see too many really big galaxies here. Well, as we then go ahead and come forward in time, those smaller galaxies will merge, they will collide, and build these larger galaxies up. Generally, guys, when we're building these larger ones up, you are building elliptical galaxies, not spirals. You know, and that's why we see these spirals, you know, excuse me, these ellipticals that are so large. Remember, guys, spiral galaxies are kind of middle between the dwarf ellipticals and the really big elliptical galaxies. And so that's how those elliptical galaxies get really big is because they pulled in some of these smaller ones. So notice what you're looking at. You're looking at some of these galaxies that have started now merging and colliding. And you're even seeing some collisions 
especially up there toward the upper part, toward the right, and the lower part of the center toward the left. You can see those galaxies are interacting. So we know that's not something that's you know, real rare. Really, originally, we didn't think that they did it that much. But we now know that even though space is as vast as what it is out there, these galaxies will get close enough to go ahead and interact. And you're looking at a cluster of galaxies here, really big elliptical galaxies. You can kind of see where on the right-hand side you've got those three really big ones. On the left-hand side, you can definitely see that there is something going on with those two galaxies. I mean, you can see this huge stream of material that's coming from one galaxy into the other. And then, pretty well, almost everything on this picture is a galaxy, with the exception of those star-like things that have pointers on them, have spikes on them. Those really are stars. Those are stars within our galaxy. But otherwise, everything that you're looking on here is a galaxy. I don't know about you guys, but I think that's a pretty awesome picture. Just thinking about the number of stars that you are looking at when you look at this picture and the distances between those stars that are so great. So now, if we talk about these galaxies, how do we know how far away they are? I mentioned distance a couple of times. And so there needs to be some mechanism that allows us to go ahead and measure distance. And so we do that by using variable stars. And there's two of them, Cepheids and RR Lyras. The best one to use are probably the Cepheid variable stars. And they're used to measure the distance to galaxies. Now, those galaxies can't be all the way, you know, 14 million, or excuse me, we're not that old. Uh, looking at, you know, 10, 11, looking at those very first galaxies, we've got to be able to see the stars or recognize those Cepheid variable stars within those galaxies. So they can't be the ones that are way, way, way back there. They have to be the ones that are a little bit closer to us. The Cepheid variables are considered to be standard candles because they have a very precise period luminosity relationship. Luminosity, you can think of guys as brightness, and so they vary their brightness over a very distinct period of time. And this relationship was discovered in 1912 by a lady of, by the name of Henrietta Swan Lovett. I just think that's a cool name, guys. Henrietta Swan. And this is Henrietta. Notice that pictures usually taken a long time ago, people don't smile very well. She just got that very bare hint of a smile on her face. So a CV of variable star is usually a population of one giant yellow star. And like I said, it has this regular repeating pattern of change in its luminosity or its brightness. And that change in brightness is caused by what we think a cycle of ionization of helium in the atmosphere. So it just kind of cycles back and forth. And we find that they range in size from about 5 to 20 times the luminosity of the sun. So that means they're bright enough then to be able to see in these distant galaxies. Now, you don't want to just use the variable star to measure the distance. It would be nice if you had a variety of ways to measure the distance to these galaxies. And that way you can see how each one of them compare. You hopefully go ahead and have all the different ways of measuring that distance come up with essentially the same number. And that kind of gives you a check then. So guys, this is an example of one of these period luminosity relationships. You've got a time in there of days, and so you can see that it cycles back and forth and a pretty regular repeating pattern of about two days or so. And based on what that pattern is, I can measure the apparent brightness or the apparent luminosity. Either way is going to work. Now remember, guys, this is an apparent brightness that we're measuring. But because I know there is a period luminosity relationship, I can look at a relationship plotting the period versus the actual brightness, the absolute brightness if you want to look at it. And then the difference between the absolute brightness and this apparent brightness then goes ahead and gives me a feel for how far away that object is. Now this is a Cepheid variable star. This one you're seeing right at one of its maximum brightness. This one has a Unlike the ones that I just showed you, this actually has a period of about 40 days. And it will get really bright, then really dim, then very bright and very dim. And so I can go ahead and measure that. And from that, then look at that luminosity uh, period relationship if I know the apparent brightness 
and I know the absolute brightness based on this luminosity, then I should be able to get a feel for how far away those things are. And so it works out really nicely because this gives us a way of measuring distances to galaxies. And you can see here is a plot of uh, the Cepheid variable stars and looking at the luminosity versus the period there. And then you have these other, these are our Lyra stars that work the same way in the fact that there is a definite distinction between the period and the luminosity. So this has definitely helped clarify how distant some of those galaxies are and give us a feeling for then that period luminosity. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a good way of determining exactly how far away those d galaxies are. Now Hubble, remember when we talked about Hubble and looking at the island universe out there when we first discovered that the Andromeda Nebula was really a galaxy. Well, that's what he did there. He looked at the Cepheid variables and was able then to calculate the distance to those Cepheid variables was greater than the actual distance within our galaxy and showed that then the Andromeda Nebula was really something that was beyond our galaxy. It was the first time that he opened up then the scale of our universe. Instead of being our little bitty galaxy right here, there really was a whole other universe beyond where we were. And you can see in these three little um, insets that that variable star is changing. And so luckily you can go ahead and measure that and then give you a feel for how far away that galaxy is. Now, one of the things that we want to look at in terms of our galactic measurements are color, speed, mass, and a mass to light relationship because we want to find out what's going on with these galaxies and, and we're going to actually look at some of these measurements. I'm actually having going to a website where we will actually do some measurements and looking at that and measuring how big these galaxies are and, and looking at some of these very specific characteristics of these galaxies. Now if I look at this galaxy and then I'm going to look at it in three different wavelengths of light. And by putting all three of those wavelengths of light together, it gives us a kind of a feel for what's going on. Now, you can see that the top one is in blue, and that's giving us what's going on in terms of the X-ray. X-rays are really high energy particles, and so you can see by looking at that galaxy that that's extremely active in terms of X-rays. It's giving off a lot of energy. And so you have to figure out, okay, what's going on, and where is that energy coming from? And then you can kind of see the green there is visible light that's taken with the Hubble. And then the yellowish color is looking at infrared. But yet when I look at that, the biggest thing that pops out right there is what's going on within that galaxy because of the X-rays. And so we're going to cycle back then here a little bit later and talk about what's going on within the core of that galaxies and what's happening with the black holes that are producing that amount of energy that's coming out. Now, the other thing I need to remind you as we look at these galaxies is something called the Doppler effect, and we've talked about that. Remember, that's an apparent, and notice I have the word apparent in red, because it's not an absolute, it's just an apparent change in frequency of the waves due to the source, the observer, or the fact that both of them may be moving. And you guys have all gone ahead and experienced that when you've listened toward a train coming towards you or an ambulance or something like that. As it comes towards you, you hear an increase in frequency, and then it passes you, you hear a decrease in frequency. Well, that's just because you're hearing that increase as it's coming towards you because it's running into its waves, and when it passes you, it's outrunning its waves, and so that's why you hear a decrease in frequency. But luckily, guys, we can also do that for light. If we have light that's coming towards you, then it is, again, going to be shorter wavelengths, higher frequencies, or that's going to be blue shifted. Light going away from you then is red shifted. So when we go look at these, di these distant galaxies and look at what their spectrums look like, then we can get a feel for whether that galaxy is coming toward us or away from us. And this is just kind of showing you if it's coming towards you, it's blue shifted, it's going away from you, it's red shifted. Now, look at that one spectrum in the middle. You've got those two bright yellow lines, which actually are called the sodium doublet. It's put out by a sodium line, sodium light. 
And so if I look toward the blue end of the spectrum, notice that the top one, it's shifted toward the blue end, which means it's blue shifted. So that means it's coming toward me. If I look at the bottom set of lines, notice that that doublet and that sodium is shifted to the right, which tells me that it's red shifted and it's going away from me. And so that also tremendously helps figure out exactly what's going on within the motion of those galaxies, as well as stars and everything else, guys. But right now we're talking about galaxies. So you just take a spectrum of the galaxy, and we are doing the entire spectrum of the galaxy. There's no way that ever, we're ever going to get individual stars within those galaxies. Okay, so we're doing the whole galaxy itself when we take that spectrum. So it says the rotation speed of the galaxy can be measured by obtaining the spectra of either stars or the gases in the galaxy and looking for those shifts. And remember, guys, that most of the galaxies we see out there are simply so far away we can't see individual stars. I mean, if I look at the large Magellanic Cloud, small Magellanic Cloud, I mean, they're small, close enough that, yeah, I can see individual stars, but otherwise we're just looking at the entire light of a galaxy. So once that speed is known by looking at that Doppler shift, then you can make a calculation for the mass of the galaxies. Now, we unfortunately can't do those for elliptical galaxies because this only works for a galaxy that actually happens to be rotating. And remember, guys, that ellipticals are not really rotating the way spirals do. They're moving, and they're all kind of moving around their common center of mass, but the whole galaxy itself is not rotating. Whereas a spiral does rotate, and so those kinds of spiral galaxies, I can go ahead and make that comparison. And so here's just looking at it visually as compared to looking at it graphically where you're getting that shift. You look at what's called a standard spectrum and you then look at what happens to the spectrum of the galaxy that you're looking at and depending on whether it's red shifted or blue shifted will tell you whether it's moving away or coming towards you. And then based on that you can make some guess some estimation as to the mass within the galaxy. Now, this is what I was talking about. Those spectrum lines are broadened. And so you're really looking at, when we're talking about a spiral galaxy, is how much mass do I have to have in that galaxy for that galaxy to stay together and to give me the types of speeds that I see that that galaxy has within those stars as I move outward from the center. Okay, So it says the amount of broadening indicates a range of speeds, and that again gives me a feel for the force required to hold that galaxy together. You know, you don't want that galaxy to be going so fast that it goes spinning off. I mean, we're not going to see that, but I mean, we can calculate those kinds of speeds. And so once we know what's going on, then that gives us a feel for how much mass you have within that galaxy. Now, another way is kind of depends on exactly how you're looking at those galaxies is to look at something called their mass to light ratio. And so if we look at a mass to light ratio for our sun, it's one because we defined it as that. Okay, so it's mass per light. Notice it says for low mass stars, the ratio is less than one. And for high mass stars, the ratio is greater than one. Okay, remember you're looking at mass per light. So when we look at our galaxy, or we look at even the stars that are just near our sun, we find that there are lots, lots more really low mass, very small luminous stars in our galaxy than there are really large massive stars. And you guys knew that, because when we talked about the HR diagram, think how many of those stars on the main sequence line were very small red dwarfs. I mean, that line got really massive as you headed down toward the lower right. Where if I think about the upper left, I've got those really hot blue stars, and I didn't have very many. Okay, so, you know, there's a lot more, more stars within our galaxy than we can see from our position. So that means we're looking at what's going on with ellipticals and with spirals. And these are just some of those really small lower mass stars. And like I said, there's lots of them out there. Compared to some really hot blue ones, this one you might recognize as a Pleiades.
And the other thing that we have to take into account as we look at this mass per light ratio is we have to look at how many stars are still evolving within that galaxy. Remember, guys, spirals have lots of gas and dust. Ellipticals don't have very much at all, as it's a very strange elliptical. And so if we look at those numbers and calculate it for spirals, that mass to light ratio comes out between 2 and 10. That's due to that, you know, large massive star is still forming. But if we look at ellipticals, they range from about 10 to 20 because basically there's not any kind of stellar evolution occurring unless you've gotten an elliptical or something that uh, because of mergers or because of something weird going on there does indeed have that evolution going on. So there should mean when we look at spirals and we look at ellipticals, we should be able to tell the difference between that mass to light ratio if I just calculate nothing more than that mass to light ratio. You know, 2 to 10, 10 to 20, you know, it should give us some range. Well, the problem is when we do that, it turns out that that mass to light ratio seems to be around 100 for both types of galaxies. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of distinction between the two. Okay, now guys, is that something wrong with the way that we're looking at those calculations? Are we doing something wrong there? Well, no, it doesn't seem like that fit. But yet, we still go ahead and measure that, and we're coming out with 100 for both galaxies. And so that is one of the reasons they started looking at the fact that, okay, is there something else going on that we couldn't explain? And that was more evidence for the existence of dark matter. So let's... We've talked about it just a little bit. Let's go ahead and, and just spend a few more minutes talking about dark matter and dark energy because it does seem to affect the kinds of measurements that we look at within our galaxy because it doesn't seem like we're measuring enough matter out there to go ahead and give us the numbers that we look at. Now remember, we've talked about, and we did this a little bit when we looked at the Big Bang, you know, the amount of visible matter, the amount of dark matter, and the amount of dark energy. Remember, guys, visible matter was a very, very, very small amount of matter within our universe. You know, most of what we have out there we think is in the form of dark matter and dark energy, not visible matter. Dark matter is hypothetical matter only because, you know, they... How are you going to find it? You can't go out and physically pick up dark matter. But it certainly seems like something exists out there. So the best evidence that we have for it is its effect then on regular matter or visible matter. So when I say hypothetical, it's only because we haven't been able to figure out exactly what it is out there. We certainly haven't been able to go out there and pick up any dark matter and say, yeah, this is dark matter. But it does seem to be matter that is undetected by its admitted radiation because can't find it out there, guys, but whose presence can be inferred from the gravitational effect on visible matter. Like I said, guys, we can't go out there and pick up dark matter. We can't go out there and touch dark matter. We don't even know exactly where it is, but we can look at the effect that it has on regular matter, on visible matter. And there does seem to be something out there from a gravitational effect that dark matter is producing. Several evidence for the existence of dark matter includes rotational speed of galaxies, the orbital velocity of galaxies and clusters, the same kind of thing we talked about when we talked about what was going on within the stars within a galaxy, the gravitational lensing of background objects, which I'm going to show you here in just a minute, and the temperature distribution of hot gases in galaxies and clusters of galaxies. And so all this evidence piles up that says, Okay, we're still not sure what's going on out there in the universe. I mean, that universe is a really big place, guys. There's lots of stuff we still do not know about that universe. Okay, now all of a sudden I have a picture of a little water strider. But the reason I've got this, guys, is because it's going to try and help explain what we're talking about when we talk about gravitational lensing. Look at where that the bug's legs are on the water. Okay. What you're doing is that bug is basically going ahead and being supported by the surface tension of the water. Well, every place that you have that leg then, notice you're forming what appears to be a small little lens, in this case a convex lens. Okay. And so we're seeing that same kind of effect 
out there in space, but it's not forming from surface tension. It's forming from gravitational lensing, but you're still seeing the same kind. You're seeing that bunching up of material, which then forms this nice layer of light around there. And you can see that where those legs are, you're getting then this ring of light that's being produced. I mean, it's acting like a convex lens. It's giving you a magnified view. So I'm going to come back to that picture here in just a minute, guys, but I want you to ponder that while I look at the next couple of pictures. Now, what does that look like to you? You're probably going to tell me it looks like a big spot with kind of yellowish white in the middle and this kind of orangey thing around it. <laughs> well, it probably doesn't look too much like anything yet, but this is actually what's called a gravitational lens. This is what's called another name for Einstein's rings. And what you have is you have a galaxy in front of another galaxy. Okay. Now, what's happening is exactly the same thing that was happening with that water strider. You have a galaxy which is now bending the space around it so much that you are actually forming a lens. Now, if you think about a convex lens, a convex lens is behaving like a magnifying lens. And so you are actually taking the light from the galaxy that's directly behind the, the galaxy in the center, that really white spot, okay? And you are bending the light around that because that thing is so massive, you're bending space. And so you're getting then the galaxy behind that where you can view it and it forms a nice circular lens all the way around it. Okay, so let's try that again. You have a galaxy in front. That galaxy is so massive that when light passes by it, the space is bent so much that the galaxy that I have behind it, which is that orange thing, I'm actually bending around the center galaxy and I can see it and it gives me then a 360 degree view of that galaxy. Going back to thinking about Einstein and the fact that you are curving space around a really massive object. Now that's the same reason that I'm getting the streaks of light here. Now this is a cluster of galaxies, which means that they're very, very, very massive. I mean, look at, you know, especially that big, huge elliptical right there in the center, as well as some of those other ellipticals. Okay, so when that light from behind comes by these massive objects, then the space around those massive objects is actually bent and it bends in the form of a lens. And so you're getting a magnified view then of what's behind that. And it goes ahead and forms it in a nice circle. And you see then those lines of light that you're looking at right here, or you're looking at right there, or you're looking at right there or right there, that is simply concentrating the light from those distant galaxies. Now, not on this, but on Blackboard, I'm going to have you look at one of them, one of these gravitational lenses, and we're going to pick out, I mean, you can see that you've got basically opposing views on each side of the big uh, elliptical galaxy that you're looking at, and we can actually see that you're seeing it on both sides. I know that this is probably hard to see from that standpoint. That's why we're going to do it on Blackboard, where you can lay it out on a piece of paper and we can talk about the differences and which galaxies you're seeing and that you're seeing those same galaxies on either side of this big, huge, massive galaxy. Same kind of effect here. You're seeing it over on the side a little bit. You're seeing those lines which you are simply going ahead and pulling that light and you're concentrating it so that it appears like you've got a light that's circling um, this particular massive elliptical galaxy. Now, I'm going to go back and look at that water strider again. And you can kind of see that we're doing the same thing with each one of its legs. You're almost getting a magnified view, in this case, of what's going on at the bottom of that uh, little stream. And so you can see then what's behind by looking at what's going on then around that particular area that the legs are in. Well, just make those legs then where you have a massive, massive 
gravitational field from either a galaxy or something like that, and you're simply bending that light around it. Now, these on the other hand, and this is from a computer simulation program. This is not actually what we're going to see in space, but these are small little microgravity lenses. This is what's called caustic lensing. And every place that you see one of those circular lines, notice that you're getting that really bright kind of yellowish line. Well, that's where you're getting this micro lensing. And when a distant star or a distant galaxy lines up with one of those little bright curved lines where you're seeing the yellow, then you're getting a magnified view, basically, of what's behind it. Right now, the technique is not yet sophisticated enough you know, to really give you good measurements, but they feel like very, very shortly, putting this in practice, if you can get all the conditions lined up, these things might be sensitive enough to go ahead and actually show whether you have a planet going around a star. I mean, they will be that sensitive if you happen to line one up exactly right. We're not there yet by any means, but the techniques are getting much better um, where they think that that might be something that within a few years you should be able to do. So not only can we determine where the planets are with the Kepler satellite, but we might be able to do that with this very small microlensing as well. So just a matter that you're looking at a galaxy that is behind this central one, the one of white, and you're able then to get a magnified view, and because of the lens that you're forming, you're getting it 360 degrees around that original galaxy. So it's a way of looking around objects that we wouldn't have before, and it simply goes back to looking at Einstein's ideas and being able to curve space. Now, dark energy, on the other hand, is the hypothetical form of energy, remember, one of them's matter, one of them's energy, that seems to permeate all of space and tends to increase the expansion of the universe. So something in there within that dark energy is causing that space to actually be accelerated away from each other. Now, evidence for the existence of dark energy includes observations of the universe that seems to show that it is expanding at an accelerating rate. And so something then is causing that expansion so that everything tends to be flying away from everything else at an increasing rate. Dark energy seems to also gravitationally repel all matter from every other piece of matter in the universe. So think about that, guys. Before, we've known that if we talk about visible matter, visible matter always attracts every other piece of matter. And so dark energy somehow seems to be a repulsion then of matter from every other piece of matter. Now, just remember, guys, that gravity is the most important factor that we have acting on a star or a galaxy. And then galaxy, galaxies, <laughs> gravity is also the weakest of the four forces in nature. Remember, there's four forces, gravity, electromagnetic, the strong and the weak. Okay, well, the other three all have a repulsion effect. Okay, gravity is the only one that doesn't have a repulsion. And so does dark energy somehow, is that that repulsion effect of gravity? We don't know. That's you know, we talked about what was going on, going on with the LHC. That's one of the things that they're looking at, is to try and determine exactly what dark matter and dark energy is. Now, I also want to spend a few minutes talking about quasars and what's going on when we talk about active galaxies. Because you know, there's galaxies out there that are doing all sorts of things. Now, quasars are what are called quasi-stellar objects. And we find that these quasi-stellar objects Notice this, guys, emit more energy each second than our sun does in 200 years. Think about that. Emits more energy each second than our sun does in 200 years. So these are extremely energetic little objects out there in space. Now you look at that and you say, well, that doesn't look very exciting. It looks like a little bitty kind of dot out there. Well, that's because these things are also extremely far away from us. And so when you take into account their distance and you take into account the energy that we see, then that puts it at a whole different magnitude of how bright these things are. Now, quasars were discovered by an amateur astronomer. Now, 
that should be astronomer instead of astronomy. Sorry about that, guys. And notice he built a radio telescope in his backyard. How many of you built a radio telescope in your backyard? This guy was really serious about this. And this is 1936, and this is a picture of him. This was taken in 1937 after he had discovered these little quasi-stellar objects. And that's a picture of his radio telescope, which is a pretty nice, sophisticated little radio telescope that was sitting in his backyard. And again, it was enough that he made some extremely important discoveries in the field of astronomy. Now, this is some of his first measurements in terms of looking at the radio waves that are out there. And he detected strong radio emissions from Sagittarius, Cassiopeia, and Cygnus. I remember Sagittarius is looking toward the center of our galaxy. So certainly was looking at finding things that were going on within our galactic core. And Cassiopeia A, we discovered when you started looking at it, was a supernova remnant. And this Cygnus was definitely a mystery and, and again, went beyond our galaxy. These are some of the intensities that he measured. And he's just basically plotting the distributions of radio waves around the particular sources and looking at their intensity. Nothing more than the type of things that you would see in a topographic map. It's just instead of looking at elevation, you are looking at radio waves. It's a supernova that he looked at, relatively young one. And again, guys, that relative, remember, we're talking about astronomical distances and time frames. But you can see just by looking at it, it is still extremely compact, extremely dense. So you can tell this is a very young supernova. And yet at the center, we have something that was going on there that's going to tell us about the core. Then in 1951, that was using the big telescope at Mount Palomar, the Hale Telescope. It was discovered that a strange-looking galaxy existed at the point that he had listed, that Reber had listed as an active radio source. So, remember that you have supernovas that were in our galaxy, you had the galactic core, but then you had that other thing that he wasn't sure what was going on. And when they took pictures of it, this is what it looked like. And so you're basically looking at a source there in the center that has two huge, and I will again stress how big those blobs are that are coming out from the center of that source. And so we have to figure out why those blobs then are being ejected by that source. Now, let's go back to a computer simulation for just a second here. And that's what this is. Kind of looks like a, I don't know, some kind of weird creature there. It's kind of going through space. But what this is, is a computer simulation of particles that are moving at approximately the speed of light. And as they go through the universe, they will then go ahead and interact with matter and kind of push through it. So we're looking at particles that, like I said, are traveling at a substantial speed of the speed of light. Now, if we then have particles that are coming out from the center of galaxies, that are traveling at the speed of light, then we've got to figure out exactly why those things are doing what they're doing. And when we go back and we actually look at what those globes are, those big globs that are coming out on either side, and we know that they're certainly not the only ones, that, yeah, those things are coming out at speeds that are extremely high. In fact, notice that most of the quasars tend to be located at the center of really distant galaxies. And notice that they appear to be moving away from us at speeds that are a significant percentage of the speed of light. Excuse me. The greatest velocity registered so far is about 96% the speed of light. Look at what speed we're talking about, guys. And so as you have those moving through there, you've got to try and account for why this tremendous velocities of these particles that are being spewed out of the center of galaxies are there. But we think that that's what these quasars are. We are simply looking at the very active cores of really very, very, very far distant galaxies. 
Now, guys, we're going to come back to black holes because that is a mechanism that we think we somewhat understand, if not completely, but we somewhat understand that if we have these black holes that are going off then that are already within the core of these really distant galaxies as well as, I mean, we think that they're probably in the center of our galaxy as well, okay, then we can account for these really energetic laws because of what happens as material is being pulled down into the black hole and therefore it's being accelerated downward and that material that we see given off is the material then that is given off by those stars as they're being cannibalized by a black hole. Now this is an artist's conception. This is certainly not a picture. But this is what it's thought that maybe a quasar might look like as it's in the process of forming. We're talking about forming the core of those very, very, very distant galaxies. Now, what do we mean when we talk about distant galaxies? Well, guys, look at these. These are spectrums of distant galaxies. Notice how red those galaxies are, and that's because these things are exceeding, receding from us at an appreciable percentage of the speed of light. Now, if we assume that all those galaxies originally started out as blue as what that was, if we could stand up somehow near them, and then now make them go away from us, so they are extremely redshifted. The only reason they are redshifted is because they are receding away from us so quickly. I like that combination of that really nice hot blue if you're right next to it, and then thinking about we are, where we are relative to those galaxies and how they are indeed expanding away from us. Quasars seem to have been found, not seem to, they have been found in both spirals and elliptical galaxies. And they tend to be associated with galaxies that have been involved in collisions. So I've got galaxies here, and if I just look at them in visual, take out those green lines, I don't really see any connection between the two. But if I then go ahead and look at it in radio waves, I see that there is a distinct connection between those galaxies. And those two galaxies, you can look by looking at their motion and how they are moving and know that they at one time certainly did go by each other. Are there galaxies that you're looking off and seems to have connections between the two? Notice how bright those centers are. Just looking right at the centers of one of these quasars and one of these galaxies. They also tend to be very bright in other wavelengths of light. They emit x-rays and UV and radio waves and x you know, all these waves that come out. So we do think that we are looking then at, like I said, the center of these things. Even though when you look at them in the sky, they're extremely small but it's just because we are so far away. And if we were much, you know, a lot closer to him, you would see these incredible sources. So this is what you, this is obviously a, an artificial color, guys, but you are looking at the nucleus of one of these spiral galaxies, in which case you have a quasar right at the center. I mean, look how bright that is compared to the rest of the galaxy. I mean, something obviously is going on there. And so the idea of those black holes, which have formed from these really big, massive stars that have very, very short lives, on, undergone their evolutionary sequence and formed these massive black holes. And we know that black holes will go ahead and tend to cannibalize stars. And as they do that, you have energy that's given off. Just looking at the core. And like I said, they seem to result from material falling into a supermassive black hole. And as that material falls into it, you have material then that is given off. And that's what we see as material that comes out, these big, huge, giant globs on either side. Now, this is just looking right at the center of one of these galaxies. And what we think we're looking at right there then are these supermassive black holes. just several pictures that are trying to bring out the active part of those galaxies, those cores. This is obviously not a picture, something real. This is just an artist's conception kind of showing you what's going on. Notice that you have these intense magnetic field lines 
and there then the jet of material is right along um, those magnetic field lines. And we see that here on the Earth, we see it on the Sun. You know, it's not like it's something that is totally uh, unlike things that we have already seen. You're just doing it on this gigantic scale because you're doing it on the scale of a galaxy. Art is conception, guys. Showing that material coming out. Some quasars will go ahead and increase their brightness over a few weeks and then fade back to their normal luminous self. You know, so I mean, we do see some variation in that. And remember, we're still trying to figure out exactly what's going on with these things. And as I said, they're thought to be the active cores of very distant galaxies. And if they are, they're the most extreme type of active galaxies that we know of. So, what is an active galaxy? Um, active galaxies are galaxies that are very active. <laughs> Just means that they're producing massive amounts of energy in their core. And we have a variety of types of active galaxies. Pure galaxies are almost as bright as quasars. You know, it just kind of is that range. What you're seeing right here is you've got that nice galaxy in the center. That's a nice, beautiful little spiral. You've also got a nice little spiral that you're seeing flat on up toward the right. And you have, notice on that one in the center, jets coming out on both sides. You're looking at another galaxy edge on, and you can kind of see that material that's flowing out of the core. trying to get a close-up of that core and a feel for what's going on and trying to decide, you know, exactly what's there, what's going on, what's the mechanism that's producing this energy. We have what are called Seifert galaxies. They're spiral galaxies that are active galaxies that show a point-like energetic nuclei. So take that really energetic nucleus and, you know, almost get it down to its up point-like source, and they show, they show strong emission lines, which means there's lots and lots and lots of ha uh, hot gas and dust that's surrounding the galaxy. And you can see here, by looking at that, you can kind of see those jets that are coming out. We have radio galaxies, which... Again, we find out that a lot of elliptical galaxies are extremely powerful radio sources out there. Now, this is just a radio telescope. You can kind of get a feel for how big that radio telescope is. And this is a very large array. The fact that you have a number of radio telescopes that can work together and you can, these things are on track so that you can move them around to get a better um, line of sight. And again, line of sight means looking at it for radio waves. And if I just look at them visually, they usually don't look all that exciting. I mean, they're still gorgeous, but you don't see these massive uh, amounts of energy that's given off in radio waves unless you look at them in radio waves. Now, this is a an actual photograph, but we need to talk about it for just a second. You've got the moon there. You've got this taken with a very large array, and then you have this kind of pinkish light right there. Well, this is a photograph that was taken over a very long period of time, and that's the radio source that you, if you would see it in visible light. Okay, so that's the actual size of the radio waves that are given off by that galaxy that you're looking at right in the center of those lines. So the galaxy is kind of like right there. Okay, and so what they did is they superimposed the picture of the galaxy with the radio waves the way it would look if you looked at it in the sky. And so you can see how big that is. That's a massive amount of energy that's being given off. And then, of course, it dissipates as it gets further and further then from the center of that galaxy. You just don't realize how active and how energetic these things are because we see them very far away and we see them as very small. Same thing with here. You're looking at radio sources and you've got two 
seems to be point sources within the center of that galaxy that have jets, these real powerful jets coming out. And so again, you're looking at those in radio waves and not in visible light. So we would never see these in regular visible light. But boy, that tells you that you've got something going on. And you also have these, what appear to be competing cores. And you know, they're going around each other, exactly what they're doing to go ahead and produce this energy. These are galaxy-sized objects we're talking about, guys. Okay, so that kind of talked about colliding galaxies, types of galaxies, these active galaxies. And so what I want to do then um, is you need to make sure that you are checking Blackboard because I've got several simulations that I want you to look at on Blackboard that will show you what happens when these galaxies go through each other, as well as doing some measurements on some of these jets that are coming out, uh, the cores of galaxies, to do some calculations on how energetic those things really are. Now, remember guys, there are four forces in nature. Strong force, weak force, electromagnetic, and gravity. And of those, okay, strong, the weak, and electromagnetic, they tend to be much, much stronger, but we don't have as much direct interaction with them as we do with gravity. But everything that we have talked about within a star and that we're going to talk about within a galaxy goes back to looking at what's going on with gravity and how that is changing because of the mass change of that star or galaxy over its lifetime. So we're going to finish here today. Okay, The one that you're going to look at next is going to be the Large Hadron Collider. And there's some ideas and some questions about what makes the universe up, what's going on with the universe that I want you to look at. We'll come back then and talk about, and there's a worksheet on Blackboard for the Large Hadron Collider. And then I'm going to take and use that information and now talk about the big picture. What is cosmology? What is the universe? How's our universe going to start? Way back 13.7 billion years ago. And more importantly, what is all that information to tell us about how our universe is going to evolve from here on out? So with that, guys, I'll see you next time.